Uh, you may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians. It's in the 15th chapter. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved. Yeah, I'm turning it off. <laughs> no, that's cool. If it's God calling, though, I want to talk. I didn't really <laughs> Twice. <laughs> it's okay. If you hold firmly the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of the first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I'm the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. I Thanks be to God. So on, uh, in the United Methodist Church, we have communion. Everyone in the room is invited to come. Uh, we don't uh, ask questions about that. The table is open and invited to all. The only thing we ask you to do is to uh, answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all that love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live at peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Those things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm sorry? What did I do? I, did I go too fast soon? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm going to read from Luke now if you can find it. If I can find it. Uh, our scripture reading this morning uh, for the message comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's in the fifth chapter. The Bible is, is kind of interesting the way it was all put together. That Scripture I had a few minutes ago was written by the Apostle Paul. I'm sure it was in there. Well, how do you, I use them. Hang on, because y'all visit quietly among yourselves. Oh, okay. So, um, Apostle Paul wrote that, and of course in his lifetime he believed Jesus would return in his lifetime. And this scripture comes from Luke, and Luke uh, really is continued in Acts. So even though we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you go right from Luke to Acts, you'd be understanding kind of the second part of Luke. Uh, it's written that way. So this is from uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's in the fifth chapter. It's the first 11 verses. It is from the Gospel. So as you're able, would you stand in respect for the Gospel? Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, and the crowd was pressing on and in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deeper water and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats, so they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. 
And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were the partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, God. So you may be seated. There's a lot of things said about this scripture. Jesus was teaching. People were listening. But really is about the fishermen. Or maybe it was about us. We tend to, to go out into the world and think we have a plan. Uh, most of us have had a plan. Uh, <laughs> I, I know that I had a friend many years ago that told me when his children were very little, they were both going to graduate from college and uh, be scientists. And I'm thinking, well, you know, good luck on that. Uh, sometimes our kids don't do everything we plan for them to do, but sometimes what they do ends up being God's plan. And so we have a situation here where we're, we're seeing these fishermen. They've been out there all day, night long. They've been fishing. They've been doing what they know how to do. These are qualified, professional fishermen. And Jesus says, well, you didn't catch anything. Put your net down, and I'll help show you how to catch stuff. And they follow his direction, and suddenly they got more fish than they can handle. And after this extremely successful fishing trip, he says, abandon all that and follow me. I began to think about the times that, that I have and been in similar situations, although never that much of a catch when I was fishing. But I know that most of the time when you're loosening and tightening a bolt, you can remember uh, righty tidy and lefty loosey, right? That's kind of how that works, except when it doesn't. <laughs> sometimes they put bolts on the other way, like on sometimes on lawnmowers and sometimes on water heaters and other things. They put them deliberately the other way. And so then you can be thinking you're doing everything you know how to do and nothing happens. And then suddenly you either get the book out and you read it or you just try something new. Or in this case, maybe Jesus shows up and you try it a new way and it works extremely successfully. Well, I think it's a message for the church. Not just this church, but for the church, the big C church, all of the, the churches. I have heard so many times in the last 24 months, I just wish things would go back to like they were. We were just talking to Ann a few minutes ago, you know, before COVID, we'd have 75 people in church on Sunday, sometimes 40 on Saturday night. Since COVID, we haven't had those numbers and everybody wants to go back to that. But let me tell you the truth. The truth is, even with the bigger numbers that we had, the church has been struggling for a long time. Maybe in the 50s, when people lived close and they didn't have all the extra things to do, there were pews filled with families. You know, you brought your kids and we lined everybody up. But you know, the kids graduate from high school. They join the military or they move away or they get married and, the, and they don't live close by anymore. And even if they did, they might have different interests when it comes to worshiping. What we know is that the membership in churches has remained fairly constant across the line. And this is, I talked to my Baptist friends and it, 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 whatever denomination but attendance has been declining. Ron Lyles, who was, the, I think he just retired, but was the pastor at South Main Baptist, told me, he said today, well, this was actually a couple of years ago, but now, currently, to have the same number of people in the church that we had 20 years ago, we have to have twice as many members. So let's don't go back to where we were. Let's try to listen to God and put our nets down in the way Jesus wants to so we actually have the opportunity to catch people. We're not really trying to catch y'all. Y'all have already been caught in the net. We're looking to catch the people that aren't here. Now, this may shock you, but it was written in the 30s, and I think it is still true today. Maybe it was written even before that. If you took the area of churches and you closed six of them, you could take all the people currently attending those churches and put them in one that would remain open. Because we're still casting our nets the way we've always done it 
the way these fishermen did. And until we start to change the way we cast the nets, we're going to continue to get the same results. Somebody attributed this to Mark Twain the other day. I don't think he said it, but somebody did say it. If you keep doing what you've always done, you keep getting what you've always got. Bishop Huey, when she came to our conference some oh, 13, 14 years ago, she said, that, that, and Bishop Jones, our current bishop, said the same thing. said, we are perfectly equipped in these churches if we ever get back to the 50s. But I've got to tell you, friends, we're not getting back to the 50s. <laughs> but we have an absolutely great opportunity to do something new. We can cast our nets in a new place doing new stuff. We don't have to be bound by the way we've always done it. Now, let me be clear. The gospel is still the gospel. The tomb's still empty. Jesus is still the message. That doesn't change. But how we deliver the message can change. I was talking to someone a while ago. They said they appreciated it a few weeks ago when I said in modern terms what that means is. Let me tell you, sometimes we've got to hear it that way. We've got to be interpreting what it means for us today. And if we just read this as a story about Jesus where he created a bunch of fish and it's one of Jesus' miracles, we miss the whole point. If this is really a living text, if it's really the text given to us by God to give us instructions on how to reach out and make disciples for the kingdom, then we should apply it in the ways that we live today. Now, most of us are not fishermen. I mean, not full time. Most of us don't go out and spend all night throwing nets in the water. And so if we get literal about it, this scripture would mean nothing to us. But what if it means in our usual vocation of worship, it's time to look at doing it different? I know it was painful for some people years ago when we took out the stained glass windows. I had a guy here the other day that was a former, uh, oh, it would be like an OSHA inspector. And he said, the truth of the matter is, had the inspectors ever showed up at your church, they would have cited you and shut you down for having stained glass that went all the way to the floor. It's illegal today. Why is it illegal? Because it's brittle and you can hurt yourself on it. So they have rules. You have to have safety glass, which this is, anytime that you go at certain levels on the floor. When I came here back in 2008, we didn't have any exit signs. We, we didn't have, uh, the fire extinguishers hadn't been inspected in years. And, and that wasn't anything wrong. It was just that they, they didn't get around to it. It's always been a concern of mine. What do we do? I, I, I was the, the, the uh, district disaster coordinator for the South District for many, many years, even before I was a preacher. And it always concerned me that we don't have fire drills at the church. I mean, have you ever thought about it? What if we had a fire? Where do you go? You know, and let me tell you, these are tempered glass. Now you're probably not going out through the window, <laughs> you know, and so we don't we, we don't think about it. It got more prevalent in our thinking a few years ago when there was an active shooter and somebody said, well, what do you do? And we have a plan. Normally, uh, once, once church starts. Uh, the door on this side and the door down on the end are locked. And so anybody coming into the building has to come down this hallway. So, I mean, this walkway. So we see them coming in. We think about those things. They weren't thinking about that in Jesus' time. We can't do things exactly the same way, but that doesn't mean we can't be effective. I'm not sure why churches think they need to have entertainment. We get so little time. So little time to be together, to study God's word, to figure out what it means that sometimes, you know, I, I, when I was serving at the other church, the children's Sunday school, they were providing snacks for about 40 minutes of the hour. And I had to stop it and I was really unpopular, but I said, we got an hour to teach a kid something about Jesus. Let's do that. If we find out that none of our kids are eating, then let's get them here earlier and we'll provide breakfast. But let's don't take our time to learn about Jesus. That's the wrong, what's wrong with our many of our citizens today is for the last three generations, nobody's focused on Jesus. And the Methodist Church isn't just exonerated from all this either. For years and years in the Methodist Church, I thought mission work was writing a check. When I was a kid, we'd go trick-or-treating. They gave us little UNICEF boxes. We went around and we collected money. All of that's great stuff, but the reality is people 
evangelism, mission work needs to be done in our community where we reach out and talk to people and we tell them about the difference it makes for Jesus to be a part of our life. Now I know Jesus is a part of all your life. In the Gospel of Mark, regularly it says, and Jesus told them not to tell anybody. Well, that was the beginning of the story. We're past that now. We can talk about it. I, uh, you, some of you may not know this. I have, a, have had a lot of jobs in my life, but for a little while I was the general sales manager of KTEK Christian Radio. And uh, my boss told me, he said, you go out and sell radio time on our radio station." But don't call on the people that have a fish on their sign or they're advertising to be a Christian, this or that. We need to reach the other ones. And in fact, there are some people that use that to manipulate us. They want to say, well, if the church endorses it or if they're Christian, they must be honest. Let me tell you, honesty is between you and God and it happens from down here. It doesn't happen from a fish on your car or a cross around your neck. It happens when you live what you learn. And walking in the light is so different than walking in darkness because when you walk in the light, you don't trip over the cracks that are in the society around us, but you see them. Paul knew that Jesus had come, that the fulfillment had been, had been given to us by God of Jesus' birth. He also knew that he lived in a broken world. It was almost like for Paul, he was walking between the times. He knew it was fulfilled and he knew it hadn't yet happened at the same time. Aren't we still there? We know there's hope, right? We know that there's eternity. We know that, that our loved ones that have gone on to be with God are with God. We know that's promised for us. And yet we spend an awful lot of time on stuff that's not permanent. We spend a lot of time on making sure we have the biggest car, the fanciest car, the nicest house, the prettiest furniture, all of that's great, and all of it will be gone one day. You remember when you got your first new car? I don't mean the first one that was new to you, but the first new car. Remember that smell? No, you don't still have it, do you? You still got the car, but it doesn't smell like that anymore, does it? Because we live in it, and we stink it up. And that's what's happening to the world around us, is people are living in it and stinking it up. And somebody's got to be different. I think about all the times that, that I've worked on a project. I, I, I've got one going on right now. Me and, and, and a friend were working on our coffee pots. Nothing is ever as simple as it looks. The coffee pots are leaking, right? So you think, not the pot, but the machine. So you think, well, this is a no-brainer. You take it apart, find out where it's leaking, and fix it. Well, that's good. Uh, it would be useful if you read the whole owner's manual first. <laughs> It would be useful if you went in there and found out if you do this, it's going to create a problem. But nobody tells you that. And so we uh, broke something fixing something. You know, that happens sometimes. Now we practice, so the one in the lobby works great. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I wonder how many times, whether it was my first relationship, my first marriage, my first job, my first interview, if I'd have spent some time going to the Lord and saying, is this what I ought to be doing? And am I doing it the way you want me to do it if things wouldn't have worked out a little bit different? How about y'all? We got stuff, don't we? Yep. And so we come to church on Communion Sunday and we confess our sins. And we feel better for a minute. And then we go out and we live in a world where we're a part of the world before long, we're griping about the guy that's in front of us at the red light. And we're not kind anymore. And sometimes we even forget that, boy, I need to be there next week to get another dose of kindness. Because we have to be reminded. I uh, have a beagle. When we got the beagle... Right after we got the beagle, I had to be gone for a while. And so the beagle, as a puppy, received the name of Devil Dog. <laughs> he was a pain. And he's still sometimes a pain, but he's no longer Devil Dog. Because after a lot of encouragement and some enticement with food, that works on beagles particularly, kind of works on us too sometimes, 
you know, we are, have the privilege now of having these two dogs. We can tell them about 10 o'clock at night, it's time to go to bed, and they go get their crate. Now, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened with a whole lot of times of going in there, giving them a little snack and working. So why would we expect that going out in one week and telling people around us in the world that Jesus is the King of Kings, that the tomb is empty, is going to do anything instantly? It's an incremental change. Our kindness affects people. And my dream always is that my kindness infects people. I'd like to see people get a little more kind, wouldn't you? And I think one of the ways we do that is by, instead of uh, reacting to the stuff that's going on in the world, we learn to respond. I was a salesman for a long time, and one of the things, there was a couple of things I learned that I thought were, were really valuable lessons, and uh, one of them was when, when someone doesn't work out like you want, or somebody doesn't do what you want, to stick your hand out, shake it, and thank them just like you just got a million dollar sale. We invite people to church. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come. We invite them into relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't understand why. And maybe instead of shaming them or guilting them or using some of the scriptures to beat them up, what we need to say is, you know, God loves you. And so do I. Maybe sometimes when, when things go a little south, instead of reacting to it, if we just responded, I, I uh, had another sales trainer. He said that the greatest word in the whole world is oh. When, when your, your sweetheart or, or your husband or your wife or your kids tell you something that's kind of uh, controversial or create conflict, if you could just respond with oh. Well, oh can be said lots of ways, right? You could say oh. Or oh. Or oh. <laughs> but you know, when you respond that way to people, it changes the dynamic. Instead of responding to them, you're wrong, buddy. You know, waving with all your fingers at the people on the highway is safer. A lot safer. Amen. And in today's world, there seems to be this thing everybody wants to, to, to get back. Let's get back at them for what they did. Let's get that guy for cutting me off on the highway. Or that darn guy, he just won't get past the red light. The light changed. And I've been guilty. I have yelled out the window. The accelerator is on the far right. I've yelled at it, people. Go, let's move. Especially when you're running late. You know that feeling too, right? And so you know what I learned, if you've ridden with me, this is a, I have a reputation, I don't speed. I don't go fast. I get there when I get there. I learned from Bishop Norris, my first bishop, that being on time means being 45 minutes early. If you plan ahead, you don't get into those situations. You don't get nervous when you get stuck in the traffic on the loop on Loop 610 and you've only got an eighth of a tank of gas. Mine tells you how many miles to empty. You know, I'm a little worried. Mine says I've got six miles to empty this morning. It means I'm stopping for gas here in a little bit. I would not want to get on the freeway with only six miles worth of gas. My youngest son called me one time. He says, Dad, when that thing goes to zero, what do you think it means? <laughs> I said, well, hopefully they put a little pad in there. And he said, yeah, but I'm stuck behind a train. Jeez. I drove to Dallas, as many of you know, for seminary twice a week, sometimes three times a week, for several years. And I got to tell you, I learned you gas up when you get there on the way back because you know what? They're going to clock the freeway up somewhere between here and home. And you're going to sit there for a little while. Now, when I, when I say that, how does that tie to the scripture? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Jesus saw them failing in what they were doing and doing it their way. And he didn't just instantly get into the boat and go out there and tell them, change your ways. He sat down and taught them. And when he got done teaching them, when he got done giving them some instructions, like an owner's manual, then he said, now, Put your bed nets into the water, and guess what? It was successful. I wish there was a formula. We'd go down to Barnes and Noble, there would be bookshelves full of how to get more people in church next week. Don't waste your money. I've read most of them, I've been through a lot of that stuff. 
What's going to get people involved in the kingdom is understanding that Jesus loves them, we love them, we care about them, and life can be changed by participating in work of the kingdom. And I don't mean may be changed. I mean it can be changed. Somebody asked me yesterday, when I quit drinking 32 years ago, they said, did life get instantly better? No. Still got fired from some jobs. In fact, as I was living through it, some of the time I'm thinking, I'm not sure this is worth it. But let me tell you, 32 years looking back, I can tell you it made a significant difference in the attitude I had, the way I dealt with my feelings instead of medicating them, the way I, I got real with other people. <laughs> I was telling this person, sometimes people call me abrupt, Sue. <laughs> sometimes people say, well, you just kind of tell it like it is. Well, I just don't play games very well. I'm not a good enough, I don't have a good enough memory to tell lies, so I can't do that because I can't remember which one happened when. In fact, when, when Mr. Baker and I play golf, you know, he always says, Jack, would you please watch my ball? And I do. I watch it every time. I know right where it lands. But by the time we have to go after it, I don't remember where that was. <laughs> but we've been into this pattern of thinking things will always work out the same way if we do the same thing. And I think the proof is in the pudding that that's not true. I think the reality is Bishop John Shelby Spong, he's an Episcopalian bishop, he said this now about, oh gosh, 30 years ago. He said, if we continue to preach the gospel the way it was preached for the last 50 years, in 10 years, nobody will listen. I think that relates to what you said about what does it mean in modern terms. I always try to translate things a little bit. You know, I, I frequently uh, equate, you know, Samaria with South Houston. That's really a Deborah joke. She's not here, but <laughs> you know, there's just we don't go places. But just because we don't normally go there, I mean, there's unfortunately South Houston has a lot of car lots, but really not any other businesses anymore. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't go to South Houston to take the gospel. Jesus went to Samaria and talked to the woman at the well. It wasn't popular. It wasn't the thing to do. But he knew the people in Samaria, particularly that woman, needed to hear the story. And if you remember, or if you don't remember, what that scripture says after their confrontation, she went up and told somebody else, and her whole household was saved. The whole village came around. We've got to plant the seeds. And I don't know of a better way. I mean, I, I grew up thinking you had to evangelize by taking a Bible with you and reading it and praying all the time. I, I don't know. I think kindness works a lot. I was working for Quest Communications. And, um, they changed management. It was very uncomfortable. If you've ever worked in the, in the real world, uh, that happens. Uh, we were in a meeting. It was in December. These three guys came in wearing suits. We'd never seen them before. At the end of our meeting, they said, oh, by the way, we're your new bosses. They looked around and said, oh, by the way, you guys are wearing golf shirts and dockers. You know, that won't be permitted. You'll need suits, white shirts, ties, black or gray suits, no blue or green ones. If you show up here wearing dress like you're dressed now, when we become in charge on January 1st, you'll be fired. I thought... Dude, I'm out of here. They're going to fire me in a heartbeat. But, you know, I was an employee. I did what I was supposed to do. Wore the suit. Went to work. Did all the stuff. <clears throat> Standing by the elevator one day, about to go up to a place called BMC Software to talk to them. They were a big customer. Spent about $450,000 a month with us. And... Uh, my boss looked at me and he said, uh, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He said, well, you know, it's kind of uh, tense around here nowadays. I said, yeah, you caused it. And he said, but you're not tense. I said, no. He said, I said, you know, y'all can fire me, but you can't eat me. All I can do is do the work I'm supposed to do every day. And if that's good enough, great. If it isn't, that's great too. Well, when I quit working there sometime later, I went in and told him, I said, I'm quitting. 
And he said, oh, no, man, you can't quit. We need you with that customer. He said, where are you going? We'll make you a better offer. I said, I'm going to work for the church. He said, oh, darn it. He said, I can't really try to talk you out of working for God. Would you stay on just a little longer? I was wrong. I thought they were hating me. They wanted to get rid of me. They wanted to get rid of the stuff. I was wrong. I read the whole thing wrong. But only because I kept doing what I was supposed to do. The way I was supposed to do it. All the way through. In my lifetime, I've left jobs because I was afraid I'd get fired. I've worked my way through it. Some of the time, I... Uh, I guess I learned some lessons because I've been doing this one for 20 years and I ain't got fired yet. <laughs> I don't think I'm close either <laughs> to getting fired. But, but I really think that, that we, we have an issue with understanding that we don't, any of us, know how to do church post-COVID. We're trying to figure it out. We don't know how to do church in a culture that has two or three or four generations of people that didn't focus on God. We don't know how to do church in a place where the moral compass is going all around. There seems to be anything's okay. In certain circles, everything's okay. And so how do we take the message of righteousness and grace and mercy into a world that doesn't even know we're here. We got to figure it out. It's time for us to sit down in the boat with Jesus and pay some attention. Listen to the word, listen to the teaching, and then cast our nets the way Jesus asked us to. Love our neighbors. Do unto others as they do unto us. Go into all the world and make disciples. And remember, he was still in the boat. And you know what he said to us when he was about to go off to be with God again? He said, go forth and make disciples. But he said, lo, I will be with you always. We're not doing this alone. It's not even our project. We're just the worker bees. And so how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to keep figuring it out. And we're going to flex and move and be flexible. And we're going to offer grace and love and kindness and mercy. And we're going to join with our brothers and sisters at those other churches. The ones that are Baptist, Episcopalian, and Lutheran, and Catholic. If we can just hold hands. We have enough Christians on this planet to change the world, but we've got to get past our own differences and get into the stuff that we're right. Jesus is the, the same Jesus that tells them where to cast their nets is the Jesus that's telling every church in this area what to do. And you know what? We're going to be just like those disciples. Some of the time we're going to be just amazed at what happened. And sometimes we're going to make excuses and say, yeah, but, but I'm like, I'm going to do, we're going to do like Peter and say, but I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be out spreading the word and talking about the gospel. Let me tell you, friends, you know more about it than the ones that aren't here. Offer grace. When all else fails, be kind. Preach often. Sometimes use words. If we can live the life that God calls us to live, we will make a difference. Now, will we all get to see the fruit on the tree? I don't know. That's not our job. That's God's. We're the inviters. We're the planters. We're the cultivators. God's the healer. And we need to give Him credit and power. And sometimes, we need to get out of the way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to sing together. There's a sweet, sweet spirit. I'm thinking we sing it through a couple of times to kind of close the door on this message. Let's sing together.
sing it again, and as you're able, would you stand? going to be really hard, but without moving your feet, look around, offer signs of peace and reconciliation to the people around you and across the room in the church, but let's don't move when we do it, okay, and offer the peace of Christ. <coughs> See how that works? And you may be seated. <laughs> I'm ready when you are you're, there, you're almost there no. oh you're there now yeah. <laughs> the Lord be with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God <laughs> it is right to give our thanks and praise it is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you Father Almighty the creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn together. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light, in our salvation. In his baptism and in table fellowship, he took his place with sinners. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He broke the bread and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave things to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And the church said, Amen. 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 Friends, as we come to communion, you're invited to come. I'll hand you the piece of bread dipped in the grape juice already. You can feel free to pray here at the altar if you'd like. Uh, and Anne will play something for us while we do that. The table is prepared. Come as you will.
Has everyone been served? I think so. So friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. This is God's table. Doesn't belong to this church or to me or even to y'all. This is Jesus Christ's table and the table that he serves us all from. Today, we've had the opportunity to join at this table with all the saints that have gone there before us. They're right here with us now.